the CNI Digital Scholarship Planning webinar series. And if you participated in a previous session, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well during this difficult time of the pandemic. We're so pleased to have close to 300 registrants from five countries and a wide variety of institutions. I'm Joan Lippincott, Associate Executive Director Emerita of CNI, and I'll be moderating the nine sessions of this series. Each of you is registered for all nine sessions. Don't worry if you need to skip some, we'll have recordings available for all sessions, as well as a set of questions to guide planning discussions on your own campus. Both the video and discussion questions for session one are now on the website. We have two speakers for this session and we'll take questions after each. Please type your questions in the chat box at any time. In addition, after the formal one hour session is over, we'll open the mics in case some of you wish to verbally ask questions of the speakers. The chat box is also available to communicate with each other or with me or our technical lead, Beth Sechrist. During the presentations, all participants will be muted. For this third session, we'll learn about assessment initiatives related to digital scholarship programs, both needs assessment and ongoing assessment. I'm frequently asked about good models for assessment, and I'm so pleased to welcome our presenters today. Aaron Brenner, Associate University Librarian for Digital Scholarship and Creation at University of Pittsburgh, and Maris Mandernack Longmire, Head of Research Services at The Ohio State University Libraries. They have very useful and thoughtful frameworks and examples to share with us. Their bios are on the webinar site, and I won't take any more time with introductions in order to give our speakers more time. So over to you, Aaron. Thank you, hello. Um, very glad to be speaking with you all today. Thank you to the organizers for having me. And thank you to all the participants for joining. My name is Aaron Brenner. I am currently Associate University Librarian for Digital Scholarship and Creation at the University Library System of the University of Pittsburgh. Today I'll be talking about assessing campus needs for digital scholarship program development. I'm going to draw on work that colleagues and I have done at our own institution, Pitt, when we were starting our own digital scholarship program within the library in 2014. This is an information gathering and strategic planning initiative for the library, but in many ways the activity of the project itself had a transformative effect that went beyond gathering information. The initial process that I'll describe was fairly formal and time intensive, in part because we were launching an entirely new area within the library at the time. But we've also reused aspects of this process in more lightweight forms when we have launched subsequent aspects of digital scholarship programming. Now I recognize that those of you listening in are likely coming from a range of institutions of different sizes and types, and that your digital scholarship programs may be at different stages. So I'm hoping that whatever your, your own situation, you might find something of value from this example when you're considering new or ongoing program development. First, I'd like to start with a premise that shapes my views on this topic overall, and that is that the practice of digital scholarship and libraries roles within it is fundamentally relational rather than transactional. I don't think that's a particularly controversial thing to say, and it's consistent with how we're talking about digital scholarship already in this series. Um, so on Tuesday, for example, um, when Pam Lack was talking about the space in which she works, she said, we want to emphasize the humans in the space rather than the technology. That's the same spirit. Uh, that I'm talking about here. And of course, um, bringing up something relational, we have to note that in our current moment, everything that is relational is different. Uh, we're working at distance from each other and we're more mediated than ever before by technology in between. Uh, but it's still, it's worth remembering how much our visions for digital scholarship and practice emphasize partnership, collaboration, participatory and public facing projects, co-discovery, and a greater place for the library and its people within the full cycle of research, teaching and learning. All of these values are relational and they all require trust and mutual understanding. And if we bring that perspective to assessing campus needs, it suggests to me that the method and the stance of assessment should be relational as well. So that can mean a few things. Uh, it can be about the process of inquiry itself. It can be designed so that it enacts qualities that develop and strengthen relationships. For example, showing interest and curiosity in others, listening, reflecting back understanding of what you've heard, co-creating, so these are basics. Uh, but thinking of needs assessment with a relational frame can also mean making an effort to learn about existing relationships and capacities in your environment. 
and then using this framework to situate your program in the library. Here I've learned a lot personally from the civic tech and data community's use of ecosystem mapping, which is intended for actors in that space to better understand existing capacities and connections uh, as well as needs. And building on that, it's worth considering that there are multiple relational systems that we are working within. Digital scholarship development in libraries is often, in the way that it plays out, a form of organiza organizational change and repositioning. There's a major question then in how we face, or that we face, and how the development of our digital scholarship programs involve or don't involve the entirety of the library organization. Because of this, I believe it's crucial to give attention to internal library relational systems as well. And of course, the support system of peer and professional networks and communities of practice is also essential. So additional relational systems like these influence the design of program assessment as well. So given all of that, I'm not going to advocate for any single way or formula to follow in conducting assessment for planning a digital scholarship program, because so much is uh, inevitably dependent on your local context and environment. What I am hoping you'll take from my example are strategies and a certain orientation towards doing this work. So to the process at Pitt, um, the process at Pitt was, was called a strategic audit of the library support for digital scholarship. It resulted in a written report and the link uh, to that report is on the screen here. Uh, the report discusses the methods and findings uh, that we, that we uh, discovered in some detail. And it also contains a set of recommendations for our local context that ended up serving as a roadmap for the next several years of program development. I'm not gonna focus much on our specific findings and recommendations. That's because this report focused on Pitt's environment and yours is certainly different. Uh, and in fact, all of our situations are now different in many ways because of the pandemic, uh, both how it's changing us uh, immediately and how changes will continue into the future. The other thing to mention is that any discrete assessment process is necessarily a snapshot of a particular moment in time. So I mentioned that one of the successes of, of our work was that it provided us with a roadmap for program development um, but to be frank, I'd put the lifespan of that particular roadmap at somewhere around three years. So this kind of work, like all strategic planning, is not a once and done process. I am going to talk about some things that I hope might be useful to you generally, and that might not be obvious uh, just from reading the report. And so there's three parts to this. The first is the context for the needs assessment and how that context influenced its design. The second is a look at the methods employed. And I'll try to pull out which I think might have been the most important and useful. Uh, the third part is some discussion of the limitations and what follow up from the process has continued to be most challenging for us. Okay, so starting with context and design. Uh, the impetus for doing this assessment project was our sense that things were developing around the university that we in the library needed to be better engaged with. Uh, at the time, and this is uh, 2014, that included research data management, a growing digital humanities community, especially faculty who self-identified and self-organized around DH, faculty hires in digital roles across the humanities and social science departments, and those same departments uh, were often talking together about how to better incorporate digital methods and tools into their curriculum. And then elsewhere, we were seeing related changes in libraries in higher ed. So as one specific example, at this time, several of us were enthusiastically reading and passing around Jennifer Vinopal and Monica McCormick's article, Supporting Digital Scholarship in Research Libraries, Scalability and Sustainability, that's on the slide, uh, and talking about that study and th thinking behind that paper. So our challenge at the time was that we had little or no user-facing digital scholarship services, although we did have well-established programs in digital library collections and digital publishing, so we had a lot of components. Um, and we had no physical presence specifically supporting digital scholarship on campus. Even more significant though, while we felt the library had a key role to play, it did not have the positioning on campus to be considered a strong actor in the space. And we didn't have the internal organizational positioning as well. And what I mean by that is not just positions that might show up on an org chart, but more like an organization-wide vision for what we were hoping to accomplish. So our library director uh, at the time made the decision to develop digital scholarship uh, with a new unit and a physical presence in the main library and to do this through a process that would both design and launch the program. So that was assigned to me and the process was what we're calling here the strategic audit. The project took place over six months. During that time, I had some release time and vocal support from the library director. Both of those were key. 
Uh, it meant that my role had a certain authorization and character that was not part of the regular business of the library. I was able to act as a kind of consultant or researcher for the library, which had a different kind of signaling and ended up permitting different kinds of interactions and conversations. So I approached uh, our study influenced by Vinipal and McCormick's paper in which they interviewed a number of local faculty and a number of peer institutions. Uh, those interviews use semi -structured, a semi-structured interview design, which I'll discuss a little bit more soon. Um, along with these, I added conversations with internal library units that had some stake or involvement in digital scholarship, and also a scan of the local environment at Pitt and in Pittsburgh, uh, and a review of relevant literature and reports. And it was clear, I think, from the beginning that this wasn't just a matter of identifying some new service areas, but that this process would need to touch on something about the library organization. So some thoughts and more details about the method. Um, there are a couple of specifics of the design that I'd like to mention. Uh, first, in libraries, we like to survey. So I remember a few years ago reading the Ithaca SNR library survey, which asks directors how their library gathers feedback and information about library services and collections. And the results showed that after informal conversations with students and faculty, by far the next most common means of gathering feedback was through surveys. I would argue surveys are better at measuring uh, within some framework that is already known to us, such as um, perhaps how many people are aware of a particular existing resource but they're not as good for discovering what is unknown or discovering what is nuanced and complex. Surveys also don't do much to strengthen relationships. So back to that relational frame uh, or mutual understanding. Instead, we know that many people end up ignoring them uh, and or they get annoyed or fatigued by um, requests for survey participation. So rather than a survey, the methods of this project were modeled on qualitative research using semi-structured interviews, as I mentioned, and uh, I ended up doing qualitative coding for analysis of those. Um, and just to continue with that um, a little bit, designating something as a special study in this case and adopting some semi-formal research methods um, rather than say, um, describing this as an environmental scan also ended up doing some useful signaling. So it made it a bit easier to do things like cold call people, whether locally or nationally, um, it also gave some cover to bring people together internally and ask very difficult questions within the library organization. Qualitative research like this um, is, is an inherently social activity. In fact, it's an activity of social exchange. Some writers have called uh, a researcher doing qualitative work a human instrument of data collection. Um, and uh, sometimes the role of researcher as an influencer in this process is called into question. So it's uh, sometimes known as the observer effect and usually meant negatively as something that might bias or invalidate findings. Uh, but in this case, the work helped us to develop a social infrastructure on campus around digital scholarship uh, in which the library was a significant actor. Um, and as another aside, I was pleased to see in the recent OCLC report on um, developing research partnerships across campus, um, which has just come out in the last um, week or so, uh, a very similar frame used there. Um, so some keys to this method, in my opinion, um, the interviews with the faculty were not designed to ask about our library at all, um, but instead to learn about what the interview subjects were doing, how they were doing it, and what was important or challenging for them. So specifically, we asked about their major areas of research and teaching, uh, and then a series of more focused questions about their collaborations, their research tools, methods, and needs, teaching and training needs, and sections related to specific areas of interest to the library. So, in our case, those were data management practices, publication and sharing of research outputs, their use of repositories, uh, and how they tracked citations and research impact. We did not promote the library in these interviews. We did not ask anything about existing library services. So it was really meant as a process of discovery. Um, secondly, uh, as mentioned, the design of the assessment looked at multiple relational systems at the same time, which ended up really helping to inform a holistic understanding of the situation that we were in. Uh, and finally, although I did ask uh, liaison librarians for context to interview, at that time it did not end up providing many leads. So I used snowball sampling, uh, which is a method of asking study subjects to recommend other subjects. It worked well and it had a great side effect of helping us to better reveal, or helping to reveal to us better the network of relationships that existed on campus. Um, so turning to some limitations and ongoing challenges. Um, 
as I mentioned, we, we did find this process immensely helpful uh, and we took many specific actions as follow-up as we had hoped, including launching a new digital scholarship program in the library, establishing new physical spaces and labs and expanding staffing. But because I'm focusing on the value of this assessment as a generalized approach, I wanna mention a few things that, and it's now several years later, seem to me to have been limitations or things that continue to be difficult to work on. Um, so you may have noticed in the listing of, um, of interviews that I conducted that students were not included. Um, students, particularly graduate students, have turned out for us to be a very important audience for the library's digital scholarship program. We did not include interviews or focus groups with any students in our initial study. Uh, we did hear consistently from faculty that they want their students to have experiential learning opportunities with digital scholarship that go beyond workshops. But initially for us, the needs of faculty were more legible uh, and the faculty were a little easier to recruit into conversation. Uh, but we have learned that listening to students and paying attention to building relationships there is extremely important. Uh, students, of course, have a very different set of circumstances uh, for engagement because what motivates them and constrains them is different. Building a more formal student experience in our case has required navigating university administrative bureaucracy about student programs, uh, things like compensation and funding and permissions. And it's been harder than it should be, but relationship, building a relationship with the uh, administrators who handle graduate studies in schools and departments has helped a lot. Um, next, the internal organizational aspects that I've mentioned a few times already um, are very hard and continue to be hard to shift at a broad scale. Um, and maybe this is a plug for I, the next session in this webinar series, which I believe focuses on staff. So I will be interested in listening to that. Um, but in our report, the first recommendation said that digital scholarship should be treated as a core service of the library, the entire library, rather than the responsibility of a single unit. Uh, but getting library staff broadly connected to digital scholarship has been a challenge. Um, so we can see it looks like some cross organizational structures are necessary, but there's not a single obvious model uh, to develop staff capability across units or to reconcile various identities and responsibilities around digital scholarship. We have had the most success there uh, in developing staff as practitioners in their own right rather than service providers. So uh, as an example, through digital humanities interests and practice groups that are internal to the library. Third, uh, as I've already mentioned, doing a discrete and largest large-ish needs assessment project means that the findings will be a snapshot of a particular moment in time. The findings were extremely useful, but it has also been striking to me how quickly the picture of our local environment had went out of date. Uh, Pitt has had a fairly intense amount of leadership and structural change during this time. So within just a few years, we had a new library director, a new provost, a CIO, vice chancellor for research, a new school of computing and information, and that list goes on and on. Um, but then on the other hand, I think that amount of change is not totally atypical either. So this has affected, uh, among other things, our sense of campus partners. Many of the, the partners that uh, were identified in the initial assessment don't even exist now in the same way, uh, or the people with whom we forged the strongest relationships have moved elsewhere. Uh, along the same lines, uh, in terms of rapid change, we found that new interests and technologies and practices will emerge very quickly. Probably not a surprise. Uh, there were many things that our initial scan did not capture that are now very relevant to us at Pitt. For example, 3D, VR, and AR technologies, civic open data through partnership with a regional open data center based at the university. Uh, but we also acknowledge that those unanticipated needs are to be expected. So it's impossible to recognize much less predict everything that may be relevant in a scan uh, or assessment. Instead, we find it's most important to be in a position to hear those emerging needs and to participate in how they are realized. To bring us back to our assessment study, I can point to that process as a spark that helped get us into that position. And on the whole, I'm glad to say that's where we've been able to continue to operate. So I'm gonna conclude here with a summarization of some of what I think are the significant social uh, outcomes from the method used and uh, also hoping to end on a positive note. Um, our assessment process registered the library's interest and stake in key areas within the, within the university. It helped reposition the library as a listener instead of a seller of services. It was a gateway to partnerships uh, and participatory design in the spaces and services that the library was developing. 
Uh, it was itself as a process, a gentle kind of advocacy for certain practices that are particularly important to the library or where we think we contribute values such as open scholarship and data curation. So just the act of, of talking about these things, for example, with, with some faculty was a kind of advocacy. Uh, it helped to build relationships. And this is, of course, is the theme of, of this particular talk. It helped to build relationships and identify existing relational networks. Uh, and then finally, it seeded new spaces that we were developing and new services we were developing with actual and rather than hypothetical users. Uh, so I am stopping there saying thank you and looking forward to your questions and discussion. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, your work piqued my interest back in 2014, was it, uh, with your study? And um, it's fascinating to hear how you've built on that work. Um, I have a question to start things off, but I want to encourage all our participants to type questions into the chat and I'll uh, alert Aaron to, to them. Early in your presentation, Aaron, you mentioned that you felt the library didn't have the positioning in 2014 to actually start um, working on digital scholarship services or programs. How did you realize that and how would you uh, suggest to our participants to understand whether or not they have positioning? I, I like the word, the term positioning. Sure, I think, um some of the ways that we we sensed that or felt that was um, was a sort of lack of people reaching out to us to discuss things that you know in areas where we thought the library had had value to contribute and expertise and places where we wanted to grow um, so some specific examples of that was that I mentioned that at that time there were um, a lot of stirrings about research data management at the university level um, lots of development of interest um, in digital humanities, people self-identifying as DH. We did not find people coming to the library um, to, or coming to people who worked in the library to ask questions or to feel like they had a, a place within the services that the library offered. Um, and so given that dynamic, I think, you know, what we were wary of, what I'm trying to get across is we could stand up services but if people aren't thinking about the library, they don't know us, they perhaps see the library as fulfilling a different kind of role. Uh, I think it sets up those services to not do so well. Um, and so what we really wanted to work on um, was to build up those social relationships um, that we, and, and in, a, in a really meaningful way, not as a way to just say, get to know us, um, now come, come work with the library, but so that people, uh, on campus who had these needs felt like we were listeners, that we were curious about their work, um, and that the services that we were designing um, took account of their specific needs, um, knew them, they could see themselves in them. Um, so I think there's a variety of ways to do that. The particular study methods that uh, I describe are one. Um, but again, mentioning, I had just skimmed that OCLC report I mentioned about cross-campus partnerships in the research enterprise. Um, and I think there were suggestions like just getting involved in, um, in campus governance, um, in, in showing up, frankly, uh, in different places is a really important basic step to do. Thank you. Uh, we have a request for you to share the link to your original report, but why don't you hold off on that? I don't want to distract you because we have several questions and I want to get to those. So when we go on to Maris, maybe you can add the uh, link in the chat, please. I'd be happy to do that. So the next question is, you mentioned there's a lot of change since you conducted this study. Do you have plans to build or on or expand it for the current climate? If so, what would it look like? Yeah, that's a great question. We have not done um, a process that is quite so heavy weight as, as the one that I described here. The first process in 2014, which was a six month long process and it involved release time for, in this case, it was me. Um, and, you know, a, a series of fairly formal interviews. We have done smaller versions of this in more targeted ways. Um, so, for example, about two or three years later, we focused specifically on GIS services within the library and we reused a lot of the methods, but on a smaller scale. Um, I do think um, 
it's probably time for, for us for a larger scale scan like this again. Um, and I think ideally it would probably look pretty similar to, to what I described. Um, but I don't have specific plans to share for that just now. Thank you. The next, uh, and by the way, some one of our participants kindly uh, entered the URL into the chat for the report. Uh, the next question is, I'd like to hear your thoughts on how we might carry that relational frame into ongoing assessment, such as how are we contributing positively to our campus partner's mission? I like very much the relational frame that you put around assessment. I'd like to hear more about how we might continue this mindset into other areas of digital scholarship assessment. And thank you as well for this presentation, very helpful. And oh, glad, glad to hear that. Presenters, so. Yeah, glad to hear that. Um, and uh, I think I, I think Maris is going to, who's following me, is going to talk about ongoing assessment. Um, you know, I, I did. I have been giving a lot of thought to, to ongoing assessment in our particular case, um, and I think I think that the way this question is asked um, is right. And my personal opinion is that here we need to start from articulating goals. So before we even begin to think about indicators or measures, we think about what our goals, program goals are. Um, and then it's a, um, a matter of design or looking for indicators that would help us assess um, the level of that progress towards those particular goals. Um, I, again, I don't have really great um, specific examples from Pitt to share there because that's a process that we're just beginning. Um, but that is the general frame or approach that I would take to that. Um, so, you know, the short version is probably that assessing the health of relationships isn't gonna look just like the counting of attendance at workshops um, or the number of, again, transactions um, in a um, consult ticketing system, um, but it's gonna look probably something more qualitative, um, it may be based more on stories, um, it may be based on things like inclusion, uh, in certain campus-wide initiatives or plans or hiring initiatives, things like that. Uh, that's, that's a good point, Aaron. Uh, I would like to mention that um, a study on which I served on an advisory group uh, done at University of Calgary on cross-disciplinary projects um, included the faculty at the end of those projects or the time period of, of the program wrote an assessment um, in response to sp very specific questions. And that was a way to gather some of that relationship information in a qualitative way. And it, it was really fascinating um, how specific some of them were about the contributions of the library. And Tom Hickerson, I believe, is, is a participant today. And if there's a public version of, of the report, I hope he'll type that into the chat. Um, our final question uh, for this segment, and we can have more at the very end, is would love to hear more about how many faculty you spoke to and were these one-on-one -on -one meetings or focus groups? How did you find a way to get their attention? That's right. So um, it was, oh gosh, I don't remember offhand. It was something like 10 to 12 um, faculty interviews at that, in that initial phase. Uh, they were all one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I think they worked w really well as one-on-one, -on -one, um, in part because they were pretty expansive. Um, I have also conducted or been part of focus groups, which absolutely have value. Um, but in this case, because there were so many different things that we wanted to ask each interviewee about, uh, we, and we, we very much wanted their personal take on all of these things and to build an individual relationship, one-on-one -on -one interviews uh, worked really well. And then I mentioned that uh, snowball sampling or at the end of each interview, I said, um, who else should we be talking to? Um, who do you recommend um, that I get in touch with? And that's a great way of opening doors to people um, to get that direct referral. But as I also mentioned in the, in the talk, um, being able to say I'm conducting a study on behalf of the library uh, you know, into digital scholarship needs around campus I think that was a much more effective way of getting the attention, as you say, um, of the interview subjects um, than to say, we'd like to get your opinion about library services. Um, so I, I do really recommend that particular strategy. 
Thank you. Uh, we have one more question, but I'm going to save that till after Maris's presentation. I think it's one that both of our speakers uh, might want to respond to. So Aaron, thank you so much for both your presentation and your very thoughtful responses to the questions. I'll ask you to stop your screen sharing and then for Maris to begin. Over to you, Maris. All right, I'm working on it. Take your time. <laughs> And if Beth can provide any assistance, please ask. I'm gonna go ahead and ask Aaron the, that final question. Acknowledging the notion that standing up services is easy, but organizational change is hard, what would you recommend libraries do for their internal assessments to derive strategies for building digital scholarship as a core library service? With hindsight, is there a, an approach you wish you'd use? Go ahead and, uh, if you don't mind, Aaron, answer, and we'll ask Maris to address that uh, later. Sure. Um... That is a complex topic. I think that's a really big topic. I think there's, there's multiple strategies. Um, the one that I mentioned in, in my remarks and which I really do advocate for is to uh, focus on developing library staff as practitioners. Um, I think there's a lot of emphasis in digital scholarship on, um, on the processes being learning processes and the way that we learn those is by doing them. Um, and on the other hand, there's also a lot of, I think, um, anxiety or uncertainty about people in the library who may not have been trained on these particular uh, methods about their capability. And so I really feel like one very, very good way to bridge that gap is to do internal library programs, which focus on cultivating staff as practitioners themselves. And I think that helps, uh, helps both in the learning, but also helps build that kind of confidence um, that's so important to doing this kind of work with others. Thank you, Erin. Maris, over to you. Your slides look fine. They okay, perfect. Up. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, I am Maris Mondernock Longmire, Head of Research Services um, at The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, assessment and what we've done on an ongoing basis. So for a little bit of context, a little about Ohio State, um, we're a top 20 public university, 61,000 students, 15 colleges. We are a land grant institution, um, 200 undergraduate majors, um, 250 masters, doctoral and professional degrees. And a little about the libraries, we're a top 10 ARL library. There are 13 departmental libraries. And so on your screen right now, you can see Thompson Library um, that is situated in the center of campus. Um, and um, we have a number of specialized collections as well. Um, what is highlighted over on the left is the 18th Avenue Library, um, which is where our research commons and our research services department is housed. Um, so while we serve across, we have the public um, space on the third floor of that otherwise 24 hour, seven days a week library. What you'll see here is the entirety of the research services department. Um, you can see from titles, it's a great team to work with. Um, and from titles, you can sort of see the scope of services offered from digital humanities to data visualization to geospatial information services um, are the main focus areas. You'll also see in the bottom right, some of the vacant positions that we've had. Um, 
for a number of reasons, um, but data services librarian, a spe data services specialist for outreach and education, and the research impact librarian. Um, as Aaron mentioned, um, I'm going to echo a lot of what he said in how our services um, were started, but also um, sort of what is driving how we continue to evolve and develop ongoing services. Um, a lot of um, our focus ends up in how the libraries can support the research lifecycle from planning research to conducting research to publishing to looking at increasing impact. In, across the libraries, we end up doing this through referrals and triage, consultations, education and workshops, um, and then also showcasing research. And what we found um, through our research commons that space as a service actually is a valuable asset that we in the libraries can provide. All right, to talk a little bit more about space and services. Um, our service planning started back in 2012. Um, so I was hired on and they had already done some um, graduate student listening sessions. There was a white paper on this evolving mode of research support. Um, we had some initial strong partnerships with the Office of Research, especially with Grant Office, um, part of that. And, um, Sort of brilliantly during our listening tour and scanning process, um, the, our partner in the Office of Research Grants, he said, well, you have all these other spaces. Why are you waiting to start your services? So we listened um, and our services started in the fall of 2014, a lot of workshops and other library spaces. And then our physical space opened in January of 2016. It's 10,000 square feet dedicated to research at all levels. And that really has been our focus of supporting research. Um, this is not the only space in the library that does it, but it's the one dedicated to research support. Um, we built our, our approach on partnerships around campus. So a hub and spoke referral model. And um, as you can imagine, at a school the size of Ohio State, there's a ton of duplication of services. And so that was one of our main tenants early on, is how can we not duplicate services? Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's a 24-hour library, so it had to look physically different than other spaces in the libraries. I'm giving you a bunch of context um, about spaces and services. Um, because before I jump into um, data and assessment and how we're going to do that so that you can have a frame to build from. All right, so here's what the physical space um, rendering looks like. You can see the different spaces that are outlined there, some for individual work, some for consultations, um, a main point of referral, um, and then some more private spaces. And what I have Next are some pictures of what that looks like. Um, there are whiteboards everywhere. Um, there are um, places for brainstorming, a lot of movable furniture, um, keeping up with tech um, that is available for the space. Um, what you'll see in the upper left are um, some of the, the dedicated computer lab with advanced um, software available, some consultation spaces in the upper right, teleconferencing room in the bottom left, and then our main colloquia space um, in the bottom right set up just for general study. We can move everything around and move materials from our storage closets um, so we can seat up to comfortably probably 60 to 70 people in the room. Um, we've hold, held colloquia here, we've had seminars, we've had lectures where we have people in person and remote. Um, it's just really built around flexibility. Additionally, so that's a little bit of the spaces. We also have um, a separate website where you can find um, resources for the kinds of services that we are providing from finding to managing to visualizing data um, digital humanities, GIS, and mapping research impact. 
um, as well as some of our guides that are both um, curated by folks in the library and our partners um, that provide consultation and education in the space too. So um, again, we don't have to have the expertise, we have to know the expertise and then invite them into the space. Data we gather. So we get a bunch of data and as Aaron was mentioning, um, some of it's useful for quick decisions and some of it um, is a little, uh, it builds on just the data that we have sitting that we're sitting on. Um, but we do consultations in person and via email. We gather both event registration and those who actually attended. Um, we do website tracking with Google Analytics. We do space head counts with Suma, and we're transitioning that to Qualtrics. We gather our reference interactions and live answers. We also track the number of partners we've had semester by semester or year by year um, over time. Um, after, so that we have gathered um, since 2014 or 2016, depending on if it's related to space. Um, and since then, we have also added to that initial list room reservations, mediated and unmediated, software requests. Um, we are able to capture LibGuide usage, social media reports, and we also track how many of our partners cross promote events. So, again, <laughs> sort of um, a prelude of is it useful? And the short answer is it depends. Um, we have as I mentioned, been able to implement some quick fixes. So updates to the website where people weren't finding information or the original navigation bar was confusing, didn't match user expectations. We were able to extend hours. Um, graduate students in the space uh, were lingering um, longer than we expected. So originally we were open nine to five um, and it got extended to nine to seven. Um, We've been able to identify new partners, make some small adjustments to the spaces, um, reconfigured the computer lab, um, and examined workshop offerings and consultation hours. So some people who had been offering consultations initially are not anymore. Um, and then we have additional areas where we um, have looked at environmental scanning. So what you'll see in the image there is a lot of um, what I end up doing with my team is about every 18 months we sit down, talk about what has gone well and what we want to plan out the next three to five semesters. Um, how are people thinking about the services that we're offering and how do we evolve to meet their um, new needs? And what got us thinking, is there a better way to tell this story? So we think there's a, we know we're doing well on campus. We see high usage of the space and services. Um, experts are getting tapped out <laughs> of capacity, but is it making a difference? Mm, in 2017, we weren't really sure. So, oh, before I get to that, I have this little environmental scanning interlude. So as Aaron mentioned, how you do this, um, it, it really ends up being a continual process. So um, what I have for everybody on our team is that all new focus areas conduct one. So these are the areas that have done them so far since um, probably 2014. Um, Lee Bonds, who is on um, the webinar today, she, um, if you're unfamiliar with the process, she wrote an article about it. And so, um, especially in the humanities, first things first for conducting an environmental scan has some really good tips of how to do that. Some of the methods she used included the snowball sampling. Um, and then we're just starting to get into the process of how do you stay up to date on your environmental scanning? Because as both Aaron mentioned and the, the folks on Tuesday mentioned, everything changes. All right, so in 2017, we started working on um, a logic model as a test for the library of how we could assess is the program working. Um, our assessment librarian at the time, Sarah Murphy, helped guide us through this process of really being able to articulate long-term impact, short and midterm outcomes, 
and then looking at all of the inputs. She and I wrote this up, and so the link is there for our forthcoming article in College and Research Libraries, um, and we use the W.K. Kellogg Foundation Logic Model Development Guide. So it walks you step by step through the process with examples. Um, it was really helpful. Um, but in addition to sort of an overarching structure, this is fine, but like many strategic plans, it can lend itself to, great, we've made it, and now it sits on the shelf. So one of the changes that we did at the same time was to pull together this data gathering plan. So this is an excerpt that matches to that relationship building. Um, it identifies different audiences, the assessment question we're trying to answer, what the criteria for success would be. You can see some of them are just um, flat numbers to give baseline. Others are looking at percentages of folks that we would like to target. Um, and then it captured the data source and how frequently we were going to do it. So along with the slides, I also sent this to Beth. So I think it's up on the website of the full logic model and um, data gathering plan. Now I should say, um, is it working? And there were a couple of things that got in our way. Um, so the first thing I would say is um, find somebody on your team and assign it to them. It needs to be part of someone's job description. Um, and the task dates that we set probably aren't actually the best measure to go after because they aren't specific enough. Um, so we want to know August we're going to gather these. Um, there are pieces of it that definitely worked um, that we knew we had and some others that we have iterated on to improve. Um, and then of course, when folks ask, well, great, you're doing this, right? Um, a whole bunch of changes happened. Um, so we had promotions and reclassification, departures and retirements that allowed for reconfigured positions. We had some successful searches, some failed searches, um, larger uh, across the libraries, we went through a library strategic planning process. Um, in addition to the changes happening in the libraries, we saw changes on campus, new um, VP for research, new um, partners that either retired, um, they no longer had alignment or there were new priorities that were established that meant they couldn't offer services um, in the way that we had originally planned at the beginning. So this is not to say we aren't using the data. Let's just, um, we're, we, we gather a lot on an ongoing basis and we use a lot of it for various um, reports and just tracking over time. So we do keep up to date um, our event archive, but we also have a pretty robust list of who has offered which workshops or programs, which semester, who was the lead, who did they partner with in the library, just so that we can think about um, what was successful, what would we maybe want to repeat in the future. Um, we use this data to assess existing partnerships and new campus partnerships, so we do share a bunch of this information with our campus partners um, immediately following workshops, um, but also um, at the end of the year. And one of the things Erin talked about too is like, um, how do you find out what was gonna be useful to your campus partners? We do a lot of just asking them. So um, other folks that have used us end up focusing on research support um, and so they need a, a lot of metrics. Um, how many successful grants are coming out of it? Do we have anybody who came to a workshop and then followed up with a consultation? So we have the ability to track a lot of that information. Um, we also have been fortunate to have some extra funding we applied for it from the libraries to get an MBA student to do a social media analysis for us. And from that, we were able to work with our library communications department and enhance the website um, again, I think that was about a year ago. Um, and most recently, we've been using this data and analysis of the network that's present to um, provide our donor relations and fundraising folks, um, researchers that can then be highlighted for university fundraising videos and library fundraising videos. All right. Okay. 
Um, so what we end up doing is a lot of annual reports. Um, as I mentioned last year, we um, piloted this partner report. And so they got the kind of information that is listed there from attendance, breakdown, consultations. Um, we did a, do a survey of those who had used consultations this year and individual events, they also get feedback from attendees. Annually, we're sending subject librarians reports so that they can see who in their um, liaison areas have made use of either workshops or consultations available through um, the research commons. And then individual presenters also get um, each event and over the semester a report. All right. One of the other changes that we've also made is um, through promotions and vacancies, we were able to take the program manager role and add assessment to it. So these three bullet points come straight from that program manager job description where it's written into her job now to track these things and help coordinate that assessment strategy. I highly recommend this and um, can't, can't say enough of our program manager and how wonderful she is um, to be able to tackle this um, as she's been in her new current role for a little over a year. And then 2020. Um, so all of our services went virtual. We were able to pretty easily virtualize some workshops, um, increase tracking capabilities by making them virtual. There's different kinds of um, reporting that happens through Zoom. We have the ability to record and save those. Um, so th those are synchronous. Um, we also had uh, a number of our experts who took this opportunity to make their workshops, turn them into asynchronous self-paced learning options. Um, our research impact librarian who has since retired um, piloted this um, a year and a half ago with the Research Impact Challenge. So through LibGuide, she would release each day a new challenge that would go out via email for over the course of a week. Um, and then our GIS librarian adopted this to do an ArcGIS challenge that lasted over once a week over the course of a month. Um, and he has also taken what used to be an in-person workshop and turned it into a self-paced or a map um, guide that walks the, the user step by step through the process. Our visualization team is also looking at this as a possibility in the future. Um, in digital humanities, there's been creation of an endorsement for teaching um, that has come through this. Uh, it, it was already in the works uh, already, and so, um, but a different kind of virtualized offering. Um, currently, this was mentioned, the folks at Yale hadn't, hadn't done this yet uh, on Tuesday, but we, it sounds like as of Monday, we will have our computer lab with specialized software available virtually that folks can um, reserve times on and map into. All right, so where are we now? This is way hot off the presses. We just um, are in this process now and had a meeting yesterday um, in our department of looking at how we can refocus key areas for the department. So we asked, each, we asked each of these focus areas to define the mission of their focus area goals, determining success and what future plans one, two, three years out would look like. And what we started with is then how do we compile all of those um, to highlight department-wide themes. And you'll see those department-wide themes over on the right. So connected campus, how to build awareness, advance research, and expand library expertise. Um, what we're going to do next is match those to the existing library strategic priorities. So both top, bottom up and top down approach to meet in the middle to determine our ongoing assessment strategy, future programming considerations, um, short and long-term goals. So um, what we have that we're still working on and it's not agreed on is how to fill out this matrix for each of those areas. Perfect. And I raced through that, um, but I'm happy to entertain 
questions um, and what I do have. So I'm going to stop my share and throw in the chat. Nope. I'm going to throw in the chat all of the links that I mentioned. So they're all there in one big pile. <laughs> Thank you, Maris. Thanks so much. I, I think uh, many of us want to go, whoo, that's, oh, like, <laughs> that's a, a lot of um, different kinds of data and different kinds of um, studies that you're doing. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to go back to the question that Aaron addressed um, and uh, see if you have um, your own take on the question, acknowledging the notion that standing up services is easy, but organizational change is hard. What would you recommend libraries do for their internal assessments to derive strategies for building digital scholarship as a core library service? With hindsight, is there an approach you wish you'd used? Now, Aaron stated that he believed that uh, digital scholarship should be seen as a core library service. I don't know if you have the same perspective and your library system is even larger than Pittsburgh. And uh, so I, um, any kind of response we'd be interested in to that. Yep. So we are actually in the process of um, grappling with that ourselves right now. So um, we have sort of a, a working group that is looking at additional digital scholarship support needs across the libraries. Um, and it has folks from all across the library, special collections, um, preservation, um, I'm gonna miss a whole bunch, cataloging, um, acquisition. So all of the aspects from um, beginning to end of the process because what we have been finding is every question starts fresh. So every time a researcher comes, even with the simplest, um, it, it typically will be like, um, the answer to date has been, it depends. <laughs> Is this a service we offer? It depends. It's been case by case. And we're trying to figure out, um, we know that there are scalable services that we could offer. We just have to be able to offer them equitably um, and uh, reliably so that folks can, um, researchers are able to predict what, what services are available. Um, we have not had a ton of clarity it, within our libraries. So I think we're on the way to those discussions um, and they have been ongoing. Everyone realizes they're important and they're hard to have without a mandate from the top saying, yes, you're just going to do this, which has not been what we have. Um, and so we know we've offered services long enough that we should be able to figure out what is scalable um, and what do we actually want to adopt as a service. Um, it's just articulating that and getting some agreement. Thank you. Uh, this question refers to something that I think was fairly on early on in your presentation. How did you know what modifications you needed to make? Were they things you found out yourselves or did the users tell you formally or informally? Um, so we did, we, uh, changes to the website, we knew it was a little clunky. We looked at our Google Analytics, people were not getting to specific areas. And so as we added more content, we realized we need to do some audits. So we had our user experience um, specialist at the time uh, do some card sorting with users. Um, and we, we did do some stopping of users that are mostly grad students at the desk of, would you know about the website? Do you think about using it? Um, where would you go to look for? Um, similarly, modifications, oh, hours. We looked at space usage, so every half, Every hour on the half hour, our students who manage um, the concierge desk will go around and do head counts. And we very quickly saw people weren't leaving at five. Um, there were still questions. And by um, switching to seven, it was a pretty easy switch. Um, we let uh, undergrad students into the space there uh, after after the time that um, the desk is not um, staffed. Thank you. Since we're at time now, I'm going to thank our speakers 
for their really thoughtful and uh, very specific um, presentations, giving you lots of ideas for what you might do on your own campuses. And thank you to all of our participants for their excellent questions. Our next webinar is on Tuesday, September 22nd, and our speakers will discuss staffing. And we're going to end the recording.